Hello everyone, I'm Naya Swami Asha and I'm speaking to you now from California, which is really a great treat. And I hope that this will be the first of many such evenings in which we can uh, talk together in this way, even though we are greatly separated physically. Tonight is going to be the first of a series of four classes on the subject of the chakras. And the chakras are a very important subject in themselves, but they also have a specific and very serious uh, implication in the most practical way to one of the most frequently asked questions I think that I get both in public classes and also in personal counseling, which is that people um, awaken to the spiritual life and what that brings with it is this sudden incentive that we want to transform ourselves. I mean, the intention of spiritual life is that we um, develop ways to be happy, ways to be effective in the life that we're trying to live, um, ways to be kinder, more creative, more in tune with God, all of the list of subjects that I'm sure motivate everyone who is listening to this talk in one way or another. But no matter how sincere that desire to understand, uh, to understand and to change is, even in many ways, no matter how much willpower um, we apply toward this new way of life, um, old habits die very hard. And our progress, instead of being the kind of smooth airplane flight to realization, um, turns out to be a, either a very long, slow, arduous journey or, or a very circuitous travel where the goal seems so obvious and yet the route to it is always being deflected. I remember at the age of 18 when I was first introduced to the concept of self-realization and reading about samadhi and the possibilities of... Uh, spiritual experience, I remember seriously thinking to myself, well, I'm 18 now, 22, 23, 24 at the latest, you know, I'll just have this thing done. And it, it, I didn't think of that at the time as hubris or arrogance of any kind. It just seemed like, well, it seems so pretty straightforward. This is what I want. This is what I'll do. And naturally, I was a little dismayed. Uh, and more than a, a little uh, shocked by how, uh, by, by the enormous gap between my aspiration and my ability to follow through on it. And it was many years, and, and many humbling years later, uh, when I began to understand the chakras a little bit better from the particular perspective that I want to share it with you. This is a very esoteric subject, and many people teach it in a very esoteric way. Um, I am a, of a practical turn of mind, and even the most esoteric subjects to me seem the most useful if we can present them in such a way that they actually affect our everyday life. And so I take the subject of the chakras and I take it from that point of view. So I'm teaching with a whiteboard. Uh, because I, this is a subject that cannot only be verbalized. You have to also, I'll, I'll make some little pictures that'll help us understand. And on this side, I have a general chart with the chakras indicated. So we'll just jump right in. This is a, a four-week series, and therefore I have, I'm under no obligation to explain everything tonight. And at the very end of this uh, series, we'll give you a few minutes to submit your questions. And if I don't, if I'm not able to answer all the questions that are submitted, I'll just save them over till the next week. So they'll definitely get answered at one point or another on this series. And if your questions are simply too far ahead of the material that we've covered, I'll just say we'll shelve that one until we get a little bit later. So do, do either mentally or on a piece of paper as you're listening, make a note of anything that you might, uh, that's not clear to you. 
It will also help me to know what points I'm missing because this is a class in person. There would be a lot of interaction, so we have to sort of figure out how to make this work um, over the uh, internet instead. Um, just to begin with, just so that we'll be perfectly clear, I'll point over here to this chart. Uh, the, the word chakra, as you know, it, it means wheel. It means moving, uh, uh, circular moving energy. The reason these are called chakras is because uh, when you think of a wheel, of course the wheel can be sitting, but you think of a wheel as something that's in motion, that, that's rolling all the time. And the chakras are not, f they're not material realities in the, in the sense that material forms become fixed. Um, a chakra is a field of energy, and it's an energy pattern, and that energy pattern, for reasons I'll explain, tends to be a circular energy pattern. There are um, seven chakras in the body, the seventh chakra being the chakra at the top of the head. For the purposes of this discussion, we'll deal with six, and I'll explain more when we get to the spiritual eye, that the spiritual eye is the way we access the seventh chakra, and therefore when you're dealing with the spiritual eye, you are dealing with the seventh chakra because you're dealing with the doorway into the seventh chakra. Now I, I need to um, put a condition on everything I'm saying here, which is this is the chakra system as Paramahansa Yogananda taught it, as Swami Kriyananda um, taught it to me, not to me individually, but in the context of his teaching, I learned from him this understanding of the chakras. There are many, many, many different ways that people talk about the chakra system. And among the questions that I'm happy to take to answer eventually in this series is to try to reconcile um, whatever you may have already studied about the chakras that might be contradicted or doesn't seem consistent uh, with what I'm going to say tonight. I'm, I'm picking it up from a particular string. Um, I am speaking from what I have been taught by those I trust, uh, combined with a certain amount of intuition. But this is not my direct perception. This is how it has been explained to me also. Um, but I believe that this system is very coherent, and it's also extremely practical, which is what I was saying earlier. So that was starting with the fact that we work through the, with the seventh chakra through the sixth chakra. I realize immediately I'm contradicting many things that other people do. That's why I wanted to put it like that. So the, the six chakras are, um, are fields of energy that run through the center of the body. We, we tend to think in terms of the spine, but we have to realize that the chakras are the chakras are the energetic center of the physical body we live in, but they are not actually the physical body per se. There are physical... Um, in uh, the, the point at where the chakras are in the body also then manifest as nerve centers and physiological um, key points in the body, but those physiological and physical... Um, manifestations of uh, the way the body functions are not the chakras themselves. The way to think about it is if you have a long skinny pole and then you start building something around that pole, you know, maybe wrapping it and wrapping it and wrapping it with fabric until the pole itself is no longer visible but a large form has come in around it but the pole is always the center point and the defining center that's exactly how our chakras are in relation to our physical body, except a, a pole would be a physical thing, whereas the chakras and the spine that connects them in, in the astral body, the energy body, is, is not physically visible. It's a vibration of energy. But vibrating energy creates magnetism, and it's the magnetic force of the spine and the chakras that actually hold the physical body here. The physical body is, is also just a manifestation of energy, but it's energy that has been gathered 
and is held consistently um, over the course of one incarnation in a recognizable and continuing pattern. Okay? Now, that pattern remains recognizable and continues to be a, a living force and the vehicle for expressing our individual consciousness as long as the chakra system, which is to say our individual consciousness, remains at the center of it. That was a very complicated way of, of saying simply this, which is that uh, you know, as long as the soul is inside the body, then the body is alive. And as soon as the soul withdraws, and then withdraws all its karma with it, which is what the chakras are, I'm, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, um, then the physical body disintegrates, literally, within a few days. I mean, instantly, as soon as the soul exits, the physical body becomes inert and immediately begins to decay. In a very short period of time, within a few days, the body is just disintegrating. Because what really animates it and keeps it alive is the jiva, the individual spirit. And that individual spirit expresses in the material world through the medium of these chakras. Okay? Okay. And so down the, down the center of the body, like a pole down the center, from the base of the spine to the top of the head, is the, the energy channel, which is called the spine. And then on that energy channel, there are these concentrated points of energy, which is what the chakras represent. And they, they uh, extend all the way from the first chakra, uh, excuse me, the sixth chakra, representing our attunement to spirit and our understanding of ourselves as entirely spiritual down to the first chakra, which represents the quality of earth, which represents ourselves as fully manifested into the material world. Now, you have to understand that merely because this is the earth chakra and this is the spiritual chakra, that doesn't mean this chakra is bad and this chakra is good. Because all the chakras have to work together in balance for us to live in this world in the right way. And in fact, for us to progress from material to spiritual life. Um, every chakra has a positive way of expressing itself and also a negative way of expressing itself. And these are the, the details that we will fill out over time. It's a great luxury, you see, to have four classes. I don't have to cram all this into a 50-minute discussion today. I can just kind of start laying out the realities here. So just with that simple understanding, and I'm sure if you're looking at this, if you can read it, the, there's details here. Each of the chakras is described with its Sanskrit word and then where it is physically in the body, the element, uh, earth, air, fire, water, that it represents and also which, of the, the, which branch of Patanjali's eightfold path it represents. No, excuse me, that's not true. Just the quality. Uh, that each of the chakras represents. Okay, I'm, I'm looking here just to see exactly what is on this chart. Okay, the yamas and the niyamas. Ah, because it represents the power to uh, resist, to express. Okay, now, let me talk about it now. Now, I just having laid that simple groundwork, I'm just going to go back to the beginning point. There's a few things that I want to get across in the course of this, these, these four weeks. One is how, how the chakras relate to our ability to transform ourselves, which is very closely related to how the chakras relate to karma and reincarnation, karma being the operative word. Um, I've recently uh, traveled and been teaching in India. This is being recorded in uh, March of... 2014, and for January and February I was traveling in India, so the um, experience of the cultural orientation there um, is very vivid in my mind. And the question of karma and how it affects us, what it is, and what we can do about it um, is, is uh, absolutely central 
to our understanding of the spiritual path. And the understanding of karma is absolutely intertwined, inescapably intertwined with the chakras. So in many ways, above all, that's the point I want to get across. <clears throat> and then the individual qualities of each chakra, especially as those qualities relate to the way we manifest in the world, and the way we manifest in the world being an indication of what our inner energy is like. You see, we can, we can come at it from both sides. We can, we can watch ourselves behave, and that tells us who we are. We can feel who we are inside, and then we can learn to manifest our inner reality. And that whole aspect of things I really want to talk about. And then, of course, um, the most important, perhaps, once all the understandings are in place, is what can we do about it? Um, how, can we, um, how can we actually use the, facts of, the fact of the chakras to overcome and change karma and to hasten our development? Because I started by saying that the problem that everyone brings to me is the gap between aspiration and accomplishment. So, now I'm going <clears> to <throat> just start laying out some basic principles here. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Every... Um, Okay, I'll start. There are many aspects of the chakras, and so sometimes what we do sometimes, what I do sometimes, is I will sort of use a certain image in talking about the chakras. It might not be completely, like, infallibly, infallibly accurate all the way up to the infinite, but nonetheless gives us a practical grasp of what we're trying to understand. So let's think of it like this. I'm going to just draw a line here as if this all just draw a little stick figure because that works just as well. Okay, so this is our stick figure again. And this is our, these are our chakras. Here's our happy yogi. Okay, and here's his heart. There. All right. Um, when we talk about the, the lowest chakra, we're talking about the earth element. And when we t talk about the earth element, we're talking about a commitment to the concept of matter. Okay, and the, the quality of matter is that things are separate from one another. I have two of these markers here, and you, you sort of no matter how hard you try, you can't get them to go together. Because matter, um, reality gets fixed. And so we see all this separateness <clears throat> in a, a spiritual sense, in a personal sense. When we're focused on the quality of earth, when we're committed all the way to earth, the separateness that matter represents is most strongly manifested in our concept of ourselves. You know, it's, it's easy to look around and feel that I am a separate entity. I'm separate from the other people that I know. I'm separate from the furniture in the room. I'm separate from the trees outside. I'm certainly separated from God. It's the most obvious uh, self-definition is separate individuality. So when we, what the uh, earth element represents is this idea that I am my own entity, I make my own decisions, and what's good for me is good. Um, in America, there was a book that was actually a best-selling book for many years, and it was called Looking Out for Number One. <laughs> Number one is myself. I am number one in the universe, and I look out for myself, and when I look out for myself, that's a wise way to behave. Extreme examples of this are people who will steal uh, from other people, who will lie, who will do violence to others, who will even murder other people, who will use their children to serve their own cause without any thought about the child's welfare, or the husband's welfare, the wife's welfare. It's all about me. It's an absolute commitment to ego. Ego being the jiva, the infinite spirit, the spark of divinity that animates us, completely identified with the physical body and the physical world. Whatever I can get for myself in the physical world is good. And that in a, in a very um, uh, simplistic way, is what the earth 
element the earth chakra represents separateness. Now, at the exact opposite pole, you have the spiritual eye. I realize I don't have to use my crummy charts. I can just point over here. You know, you have the spiritual eye. You don't want to read it that much. You may not see all the text clearly. The text doesn't matter. Okay, it's the spiritual eye. I'll go back here then because it's easier. The spiritual eye. It's less confusing. And the spiritual eye represents our individuality united with the greater reality, which is I know myself to be one with the infinite. And through the spiritual eye I can merge with the infinite, which is what, what the Sahaswara, what the seventh chakra at the top of the head represents. So when I move through this world, I, I could no long, I could no more imagine you know, taking from another person than I would want to cut off my own hand because my sense of identification has been liberated from this egoic separateness and has been united in a, a sense of spiritual oneness with all of creation. You know, this is where stories like Sri Ramakrishna, um, when the cook in his ashram uh, beat the cat with a wooden spoon to get it out of the kitchen, Ramakrishna, the welts appeared on his back. And the cook was appalled when he saw the welts on the back of Ramakrishna. But Ramakrishna said, well, when you beat the cat, you beat me. I mean, so much so that he could manifest on his body the, uh, the results of action taken against another physical body because his consciousness was everywhere. Yogananda described when, toward the end of his life, he was walking with Swami Kriyananda and he stumbled a little bit, Swami, uh, Yogananda did. And Swamiji had to hold him up and Master said, I'm in so many bodies, I sometimes forget which one I'm supposed to keep moving. He said, I have to ask other people if I've eaten or not. Because he just was everywhere. If you ate, maybe he did also. And, and he just couldn't figure out among all the arms and legs that he was inhabiting which ones he was supposed to be individually responsible for. This is the spiritual level. And the earth chakra, by contrast, represents, um, as I was saying, complete indifference to everyone but oneself. I'm going to put now the picture a little differently. So we have a spectrum. Let's call it a spectrum between complete spiritual understanding, and we'll just make this kind of a blob like that, and complete separation from higher spiritual truths. Now, I have to put a caveat in here that each of the chakras serves a divine purpose as well, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm talking about the choices that we can make between being completely separate or completely unified with reality itself, with the greater reality. Now, every time you have a thought, an attitude, an action, a decision in your life, in my life, that response to life falls somewhere on this spectrum, somewhere between the sense of being totally separate, taking care of myself, and that being the only way to happiness, and this idea that I am part of a greater reality and, and I, there's no way that I can move in this world without being connected to that whole. So if, for example, someone, let's use a simple, dri a simple example of driving in a car, which most of us do, and somebody does something really um, threatening to you. When I was in India not too long ago, mostly I'm I don't drive myself, of course, it's the wrong side of the road, among other things, among a thousand other things. But um, I'm usually pretty relaxed with the traffic pattern. I just figure that people know what they're doing and my life is in God's hands. But I'm not immune to um, identification with the body and anxiety about what might happen to it. And we were just going along and somehow the driver was really unconscious. And he, in a big car, was just coming right at us like this, 
big one, and he was in a, one of the bigger cars, and we were one of the little ones. He was just coming right at us with a lot of speed. And I looked up and I saw him, and my immediate response was not one of unity. Oh, well, here I'm going to just give up my body and merge into the infinite, which it's quite possible to feel that way even in the face of a physical threat or physical death. Um, there's the story in Autobiography of a Yogi of the uh, sadhu that the police mistook for a violent criminal, and when the sadhu did not respond to their command to stop, the overzealous policeman took his machete and sliced off the arm of the sadhu. The sadhu didn't even flinch. He just calmly picked up his arm, reattached it, and by his miraculous healing powers, it was perfectly fine, and then calmly said to the policeman, I'm not the man you're seeking. There was no, his sense of unity with the greater reality was so fixed in his consciousness that even the, the attack on his body didn't cause him to separate from that greater reality enough to defend it or even to respond to the pain that an ordinary person would feel. Now, I'm in this car and all of a sudden this big uh, thing is coming at me and my response was, the most natural response in the world. <gasps> like that. You know, just this complete sense of tension, which expressed itself as not a, not a hysterical cry, but a definite cry. And of course, just in that moment, the driver became conscious too and went around us. But that, uh, in a moment of crisis, concern for my physical body, identification with it, concern about pain, is an indication of where my consciousness is. And if somebody insults you and treats you very rudely and says, well, that was a really crummy piece of work, and your first response is, yes, and it was good. You, what do you know what you're talking about? Who are you to talk to me like that? How dare you? Or and nobody ever really appreciates what I do. You know, I'm really so good and so sincere and nobody appreciates me. All of these indicate a certain level of consciousness, a certain definition of reality that is not philosophical, but is simply where we vibrate. You know, if somebody punches you and your first response is to hit them back, if somebody is really mean to you and your first response is to be mean back to them. I uh, had this experience when my husband David and I were traveling in a motorhome. This was many years ago. And the motorhome was large enough to have a separate kitchen in the back. It was a, really this great moving house. It was fabulous. And David was driving. We were driving on a mountainy road. And he, it, his, the, he let the car drift a little, and he made a rather sharp turn to get back into the lane where he needed to be. I was in the back, and I had a one-pound peanut butter jar. And I was, had it open, and I, I had just pulled it off the shelf, actually. It wasn't open. I was making a sandwich. And when he made that sharp turn, it slid right off the counter and hit my foot. Fortunately, it didn't do any real damage at all. But the impact of that peanut butter jar on my foot, especially unexpectedly, um, was painful. And I, I cried out mildly, you know, ow, like that. But what was so interesting to me was that my foot, my foot was hurt because the car had jerked, the motorhome had jerked, David was driving, and so my foot hurt, and I had this impulse that if I took the pain I was feeling in my foot and directed it at him by saying, you know, whatever I wanted to say, be more careful, why did you do that, don't you know I'm back here trying to make lunch, you know, just... I'm making lunch for you and this is how you treat me. I mean, all the ways that the mind works. Fortunately, even though it all happened very fast, I caught the impulse and I realized that my foot hurts. If I now create emotional pain in my husband, it's not going to do any good for my foot. But there was this feeling that if I could pass the pain on to someone else, then somehow I would have less of it. Okay, this is an indication of a sense of separate consciousness. I have pain, if you have pain, then all hurt less. This is what causes people to physically fight 
and to emotionally fight. You've hurt my feelings, now I'm going to hurt yours. Like, how is that going to help? You know, now more people are suffering in the world. How is that going to help? This is the exact opposite of having a unified consciousness where the cook can strike the cat and the welts appear on Ramakrishna's shoulder. Now, the, there's endless examples of this, of the way in which we simply take care of ourselves. Um, I know there are practical limits to this in a country like India where there is so much manifest physical poverty, certain decisions have to be made about, on a practical level, about what you can actually do. But what you decide to do in a practical way can still come from a sense of unified consciousness. I'll, I'll go right to that example, because whenever I'm in India, that's the example that's always asked of me. When our consciousness is unified with the, design, uh, with, with the divine, we are able to act in accordance with God's will. And our actions do not come from a sense of egoic necessity to, in many ways, ease our own guilt and suffering but come rather from a unified sense of what God really wants us to do. A great deal of anxiety about social conditions in an odd sort of way, and I'll, I'll get into this in more detail when I go through each of the chakras. A great deal of anxiety about social conditions, external conditions in this world, actually comes from an insufficient sense of unity with God's plan that these people don't have what I have, therefore they must have what I have. I have to give them what I have. I have to change their circumstances. Now, you may be genuinely inspired by God to take up that kind of work because it's the right expression of your own consciousness. But sometimes what's really happening is that I need to make the world a certain way because I'm uncomfortable, that I'm not comfortable with God's plan here. My consciousness is not sufficiently unified with the divine for me to to see God's hand in what's going on in the world around me. You know, the masters are very compassionate um, about the sufferings of others and very charitable and generous in their response to that suffering, but they're also very calm about it. They're neither guilty nor anxious because they recognize that they're unified with the flow of divine energy and everything that they see around them they see as a manifestation of that energy. And so there's there's no reason to be anxious. This is God's plan. I I believe it was Ramakrishna who responded to a, a, a devotee who came to him and boasted about all the good work that he'd done in the world, how much money he'd given here and how much he'd helped there and how much he'd done this. And Ramakrishna, like a child, just said, my, my, I wonder how God got along before you were born. (laughs) So sometimes even what looks like good work, and may in fact be good work, relatively speaking, still comes from a sense of separateness than from a point of unity. So, coming back to this basic point, everything we do falls somewhere on this spectrum. And let's put the heart sort of right here in the middle. And it has to do with a a definition of a few different questions like, you know, who am I? Am I really just the physical body or am I a manifestation of divinity? And then you would say, what is, what is real? What is eternal? What is lasting? I, I will use the phrase lastingly real. You know, what, what, is, what carries on from incarnation to incarnation and what is just a flash in, in, in momentary time? You know, this, my foot hurts. It hurts for just a second. I'm not my foot anyway. I'm the eternal spirit. What is lastingly real? Um, even just in a very practical way. You know, the, the relationship that I have with my husband, the long rhythm of that relationship is more important than the fact that the peanut butter jar fell on my foot. 
So who am I and what is lastingly real? Do I want to make my life on the fact that he, he jerked the car a little bit? You know, maybe his mind wandered and he had to put the car back in place. Do I want to make my relationship on that moment? Or do I want to stand back and think of all the positive realities that we live together and act in such a way as to foster what is lastingly real? You know, I may be angry at someone because of some little unkind thing that they did, but do I want to perpetuate the karma of him being mad at me and then my being mad at him and then him being mad at me? You know, what is lastingly real? In this moment, the sense of separateness may be the reality that I'm inclined to respond to, but who am I in a bigger sense? And what is lastingly real? And most importantly, this is the question, where does happiness come from? Does happiness come from, um, does it come from my being able to pass on the pain that I have and therefore having expressed myself and shown them who I am? Or does happiness come from a recognition that everybody has their own reality and the more we can support the divine plan in what we do, the more happiness we will have in our own lives. Now bear in mind, sometimes the divine plan is to speak very sternly. I was with Swami just speaking of poverty. I was with Swamiji and we were in Europe somewhere and he had an interesting attitude toward people who would beg for money. Uh, he, he wasn't automatically sympathetic because some people he felt were begging for money because they just found it easier than working. And this uh, relatively young man who probably was begging for money because he was either alcoholic or drug addicted, we were walking down a pedestrian mall somewhere in Europe and this young man comes up begging for money. Swami looks at him and he opens, Swami pulls out his wallet and opens it and he pulls out one small bill. He said, I'm giving you this. He said, I'm capable of giving you much more, but this is all the money I'm going to give you. I'm going to give it to you just this once. You are a young, fit, able-bodied man. You should be working. And then he, but he gave him that little bit of money. But he also took the opportunity to really tell this man that he really needed to straighten his life out. And I've seen Swami on more than one occasion. He'll respond according to what he feels the divine is asking him not from anxiety, oh, this poor person, I feel badly, I have lots of money, he doesn't, I need to empty my wallet into his hands. It's just a, a calm, unified sense. Where does happiness come from? What is lastingly real? Who am I in relationship to this? So whenever things happen in our lives, instinctively we are always ans answering this question in some way. You know, gee, if I... Uh, just do this, then maybe I'll get the promotion and he won't. Or I can make him look bad and I can make myself look a little better. Um, all of these things. Or I'm in the car and I'm perfectly capable. I may have just delivered a, a lecture on the question of death and reincarnation and rebirth and said so calmly and beautifully that we are one with the infinite. What is there to fear? And then this big car comes at me on the road and my first thought is for my own well-being. Now, the point here is, every time we respond to life in any way, we are affirming some reality or another. You know, when you deeply love your child, your heart is really open. When you have a deep meditation, you're, you're putting a lot of energy into your unity with spirit. When you... Uh, become anxious and angry, um, which we all do at times. We're affirming a reality here. I was uh, amused on our when we were toward the end of the, the most recent trip to India. Uh, three of us were in the car together and two of us were taking a flight and the third person was going to the airport. And we had been told that the airport was right, that the hotel, excuse me, two of us were taking a flight and had to go to the airport. The third had to go to a hotel, we were told the hotel was right near the airport, but of course the hotel was just past the airport. So near, it was relevant whether it was which side, and it was also relevant as to whether or not it was rush hour. So the just 10 minutes actually literally became an hour and a half. 
very short distance, but because of the traffic and because of these strange, you know, you have to go past and make U-turn sort of systems, um, it took us a full hour and a half. We had, in fact, allotted plenty of time. But it was really interesting to watch my friend and I, as time was elapsing and we were caught in the traffic and we weren't able to get to the hotel and the airport was behind us and we had to catch this plane, we, this anxiety began to come into both of us. And it lasted just a couple of minutes, really, literally just a couple of minutes. But it just came from who knows where. That, oh, we're going to miss the plane and what's going to happen to us and all of this, instead of being in a unified sense of reality, we were in a separate sense of reality. And gradually we completely calmed down, very quickly relatively, and we just realized whatever happens, happens. First of all, it doesn't matter if we miss the plane and on and on and on. And of course we got to the airport exactly on time and the plane was delayed two hours in any case. But every time we make a decision, we're affirming a certain reality. Now, we like to think that we get away with it. We like to think that, well, it's just the privacy of my own mind. It's just my own thoughts. Peanut butter jar falls on my foot. I want to yell at my husband. I don't. Well, that's the end of the story. You know, we have this false idea that if we don't articulate it, or even if we do articulate it, well, it's just a minute, now it's, now it's past. Or if I'm alone in my car and I'm raging at the other drivers for being such idiots and putting my life in danger, that it's, it's fine. It just, nothing happens. And that is our great mistake. Because we are nothing but an energy pattern. And the physical and emotional life that we live, the opportunities that come to us, everything that happens is the result of karma. And karma is an energy pattern a magnetic force that goes out into the universe that draws to us exactly what we're meant to have. And that karma is determined by the energy pattern of who we are. That energy pattern of who we are is the chakra system. And every time anything happens in our life, it registers on this spectrum, which is represented between earth and spirit, Wherever it falls between earth and spirit, the energy that we have put out registers as energy in the appropriate chakra. So the chakras are, even though they become extremely mysterious and esoteric in all these uh, true and interesting ways, they are, they are nothing but the accumulated result of every action, every thought, every decision um, on the vibration that we ourselves express it. Okay? So at, at the end of a day or the end of an incarnation, what we're looking at, each chakra vibrates um, according to how much energy we've added to it. Now, this chakra system also, and I'm not going to be, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. This chakra system also carries from incarnation to incarnation. This is the medium by which karma is carried. So let's say, for example, there's somebody close to us who wants to be close to us, but we don't really like them very much. And so we're always conscious of the fact that I don't like you very much. You know, you, you want to be friends with me, but I think you're icky. And even though you have a, you know, you're a very open-hearted to me. I'm not at all open-hearted to you. I don't have a sense of, of your reality. I'm not unified with your reality. I'm very conscious of my separateness. And not only am I not open to you, and we don't have to be open to everyone, but I actually uh, you know, wish you ill. Now see, there's, there's different steps, because you can behave appropriately. Maybe somebody wants something from you that is not an appropriate request. That they themselves are distorted in their thinking what they want from you is not something you're ever going to give them. And it's fine and, and right to behave appropriately, but you can't at the same time be mean in your heart. You have to be, still have to understand this is a divine soul finding its own way. And you can be 
distant with someone, but still on a divine level remain unified in your heart. This is not God's plan that I give you what you want, but I'm, I'm not uh, unconscious of, of your divine search. I mean, that's getting a little bit subtle, but I'm saying these are all what is lastingly real. Who am I? Where does happiness come from? It falls in a certain spectrum. But we build up certain karmas. Um, I was thinking just uh, yesterday about someone who, who's passed from this world now. And I behaved relatively well in relation to them. But I still hold in my heart a feeling that I never fully appreciated their reality. And so I feel that as a kind of unresolved karma. You know, it's just sort of about here on the spectrum. And I know that I consistently uh, was clinging too much to my separateness and not enough to my unity. So in the, the, the chakra of, that vibrates like that, I know there's this un, unfinished business that I'm going to have to deal with. So when we're looking at our chakras at any particular point, we're looking at the accumulated result of every action and every decision that we've made. Now, the more decisions that we make that lift us up, at least from the heart, up toward the spirit, and don't emphasize so much our, our separateness, which is what the lower chakras tend to represent, um, the more everything in our life will flow in that direction. And what happens to us, you see, is we, we might begin to open our hearts and make a certain decision, but each of these chakras represents a field of energy, and it's a habit. It's a habit to be concerned about the self. It's a habit to worry about what's going to happen to me. It's a habit to have answered these questions in a certain way. So even when I begin to want to reach out in a more expanded and unified way, the habit of self-concern is there. Oh, look, here's a wonderful person. I'd really like to be friends with them. Let me see what I could do. But you know, maybe they're just not going to like me like everyone else has not liked me. Or maybe I'm really going to be nice to this person, but he's going to be mean to me as everyone else has been before. And so the energy just goes like this. And we end up walking around as this, we're always walking around as these competing um, uh, levels of consciousness. And when we, the mere idea that we want to become somebody else only begins to shift the relative magnetism. And if we've been evil or selfish or in delusion for a very long period of time, we begin to build energy at a higher level, but it won't immediately erase everything that we've done before. Now there's many other aspects to this, and because we're just starting our discussion tonight, I recognize that I'm leaving us in a state of relative confusion because it's just not possible in this first hour to go through this. So I'm going to, this is going to be like the cliffhanger. We have the heroine is tied on the railroad tracks. So we have the devotee trapped in this confusing array of karmic conditions. And so we'll have to go into the next episode to figure out how we're actually going to resolve it. We have some questions. Okay, let me see what we have. Well, the question, how can we maintain the balance between lower and upper chakras? In actual fact, um, I think the phrasing of that question, the balance between lower and upper chakras, is not the right question. The question is, and uh, this is what we have to progress through, is that every chakra has a positive and negative way of expressing itself. And so what you want to do is you want to turn the qualities of every chakra in an upward moving direction, and then there's no question of upper and lower. For example, the earth chakra, in its negative form, takes the quality of the earth, of the material world, and creates separateness. The positive expression of the earth quality is that we are steadfast, we are committed, we are grounded, even in our spiritual aspiration. So when I begin to talk about each chakra individually, what I'll talk about is how you take 
what could be seen as a negative, which is this fixed world, but instead of allowing it to um, sort of go out on that level where we seek security in the fixity of the world, instead we use the quality of the earth to become solidly committed to our um, higher ideals, and then it balances automatically. Because we have to have um, the quality of all the lower chakras as well, because otherwise even the upper chakras don't function properly. All, all of them are required if you're merely um, have spiritual aspiration, but you're not grounded in, in loyalty and solid understanding of what that means, there's no way that you can strengthen this chakra without having this one also cooperating. So we'll go into that more as we progress. Please explain the role of the lower chakras in spiritual life. Well, I was beginning to. The, the, this, this is loyalty. This chakra is the, the creative capacity to flow intuitively with life. That's the water chakra. This is fiery self-control. Now, the creative capacity to flow with life can also go into an, a never-ending desire for sensual experiences. Instead of using it creatively to inspire yourself on a higher level, you use it in the most obvious way to seek um, ever-changing satisfaction from the things of this world. Fiery energy can either be used to dominate and um, interfere with the destiny of others, or it can be used to direct one's own energy in a spiritual way. Um, this is just the beginning, but each of all of the lower chakras have to be in order for the upper chakras to work properly. So we'll go into that a little bit more. How are we to know which of our desires, um, or which of our chakras are less evolved or developed? Well, that also will come, because when we understand what the qualities of each of the chakras are, you can look at the way your life is manifesting, and you can begin to see um, where the weaknesses are. I'll use an example between the heart and the earth chakra, a very good example. Many people are very loving by nature. They have an open-hearted quality. A, a dear friend of mine, in such a sweet way, said to me, she said, loving people has always come very easily to me. I, I thought that was just so sweet. She says, I naturally give love to everyone. And that's very dear. Not everyone does that. But some people from their heart just naturally have a loving quality toward everyone. Now, you can be like that, but if that love is not um, also uh, based on uh, fiery self-control, which is this is the fire element, or the, or the self-control to realize that merely because I love everyone, it doesn't mean that I can go along with what everybody wants of me, or that I can I might get my, my love for people may cause me to get really drawn into bad company all the time, or to make very bad decisions in who I choose for my friends, you know, or to spend all my time trying to help some, uh, you know, some poor dark person. Uh, a friend of mine was described once as whenever she goes into a group, she finds the darkest person there, and then goes over immediately and tries to befriend them. Now, on one hand, that's very sweet, that the person is always wanting to reach out to the darkest person. But the result is, is that her own life was just chaos. Because all these dark, meaning all these downward pulling people, she was always just completely engaged in this downward pulling world, and she did not really have the, the strength of character that comes from the uh, third chakra or the solid understanding of spiritual truth. Him, who am I really? That enabled her to actually help those people or at the same time not to confuse her own life. So such a person really developing the heart quality was less important than for her to develop the earth quality, I am loyal, I am steadfast, I, I know what the truth is and I hold to that truth. You know, the fire of divine light burns up all limitations in me, all, in this case, compulsive energy that sends me off on wild goose chases instead of allowing me to hold strong. 
So by understanding the essential qualities of each chakra, which we will by the time we're done with this course, the essential qualities of each chakra, then you can say, oh, I, I see. I'm very strong in calmness, but I just don't have enough fire in my life. I'm very good at remaining calmly detached, but I'm really lousy at actually using my willpower to get engaged. So we can see that it's not that we're wrong, it's, and this is the question I was asked, it's just that we're out of balance. Because every single chakra has something vital to contribute to our overall well-being. I didn't really go to that aspect of it today. What I was talking about today, beginning to talk about, is just simply how the chakras are created. The chakras are the, the, the storage bank of all of our actions. It's the, it's the mechanism by which karma is both created, then communicated, then carried on to the next life. Karma is cause and effect in human relationships. How does it happen that if you steal somebody's money in one incarnation, your own money is stolen in the next life? It's because you have registered this thievery, which is that it doesn't matter what happens to you, it only matters what happens to me. And let's say it gets registered in the third chakra in the negative, which is that I've used my self-control to dominate others. And that becomes a karmic condition that, that eventually has to be balanced. That eventually one has to realize that what is lastingly real is not what I can get from you, but my unified relationship with the greater reality. Now, I recognize I've raised more questions than I've answered, but I've just tied the heroine to the railroad tracks. The train is coming. How are we ever going to get out of and resolve all of this? Well, we have three more sessions. And in those sessions, we'll do our best to do that. If you have any questions um, that didn't get a chance to be answered, just send them in and we can deal with them in the weeks to come. So I think that will be enough for this evening. So God bless.